Awesome. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about a project that we've been working on for the last couple of years uh, that's called Deep Dive, and it's a data system for macroscopic science. Its goals are not dissimilar to the talk that we heard before, but we're academics, so I'll talk to you about all the different people we've been playing with over the last couple of years. Now the system is available, there's a website, you can go download it, it's on GitHub, you can pull it whenever you like. From a computer science standpoint, the thing that's most interesting about Deep Dive is that we're trying to raise the level of abstraction that people write machine learning programs. So there are a lot of frameworks out there that help you write a new machine learning algorithm. That's not what Deep Dive is about. What Deep Dive is about is trying to raise the abstraction that maybe a scientist, as we'll see, can interact with the system and build a machine learning, pretty sophisticated machine learning system that's able to do what we call knowledge-based construction. So read in a bunch of unstructured information and populate a database, maybe do some predictive analytics on top. And the core interesting piece from the CF side is that since we've raised this level of abstraction, the system has a lot more work to do under the covers. And a lot of our research papers by volume are about how to solve dif difficult statistical inference problems before the heat death of the universe. So what I'm going to talk about is why we did this. Uh, and I'll tell you just a little stupid story that I like to tell. I'm going to tell you what we did and what deep dive actually is and what you could actually download. And I'll tell you a little bit about how. And also, uh, I'm going to take in the end of the talk, uh, the first time I'm going to announce some stuff that we've just actually released, the papers are just posted, code is just posted, about how we're taking uh, the deep dive extraction system and fusing it with some things that are convolutional neural nets to actually fuse across text and images simultaneously. And so that'll be at the end of the talk. But first, I want to tell you a story. This is a story about how we actually got started. So our story begins uh, with Isaac Newton. Uh, Isaac Newton may be a strange place to start. Uh, general intellectual badass, uh, co-discoverer of calculus and physics. So what did Newton do when he had his, his great discoveries? Well, he set them down in a book. Here's the book. It's actually an original uh, copy in Latin of Principia Mathematica. Now, it turns out Newton was not alone. Uh, each one of us till today, when we have a discovery, as was mentioned during the last talk, set down our findings in some kind of paper. Put it out there. We publish it in you know, a 10 to 12 page or 50 page journal article. And we push it out onto the web. Now, not surprisingly, uh, this millennia of knowledge have accrued in places, places like libraries, that store the knowledge of papers published over you know, the last thousand years or so. About 15 years ago, something amazing happened. All this information became freely available online, or large fractions of it. You can type in Principia Mathematica into Google Books, and you get back not only a, a PDF, if you like, or a, a copy of what you're looking for, but you actually get an English translation. <coughs> So in a way like never before, the world's scientific knowledge is accessible. It's at our fingertips. And this is really something that's only happened in the last 10 or so years. If you know what you're looking for, you put that into a search engine, and back comes the information that you want. But there's still a problem. And the problem is, we're still human. As our friend illustrates here, we have two different problems. One problem is simply holding all the papers that you would want to read. It's actually not too much of a problem. right? Your Kindle or your laptop could basically hold every piece of information that you would want to read in your lifetime. But instead, the problem, as was illustrated in the last talk as well, is that even for the narrowest of scientific questions, you simply can't keep pace with all the information that's out there. You can't possibly read it all. No small group of individuals, even, can pull all that information together and understand and assess what's going on uh, in their field. So this is why we say the world's scientific knowledge is accessible in a way like never before. I can get to it if I know it's out there. But it's not readable in any essential, in essential way. You can't put it together into one place, analyze it, and and really understand the collective body of science about even very, very narrow topics. Now, what makes this much worse is that today, many of the problems that we're interested in and scientists around campus are interested in are what I would call macroscopic problems. So a macroscopic problem is something where you have to take all the information that's out there, assemble it into one place, and use all that information to make your best estimate. So an example of a macroscopic challenge would be something like estimating the climate. What's going to happen in our climate? To understand this, how climate affects die-offs and all kinds of things like that. You need to understand the fossil record. You need to understand the geochemical properties of the Earth. You may need to understand some pieces of things that are being published in obscure journals about you know, forest cover. You want to take all that information and put it together. Well, this is not in the abstract. We've actually been doing this for the last couple of years. And I'll tell you about some examples that we've been working with. So one example that I'll talk, spend a little bit of time about is in climate and biodiversity. You want to go out there and read all this interesting scientific literature, all these government reports, read them with a machine, put them in one place, and then allow scientists to be able to make their best estimates about certain natural phenomena. In the last couple of years, we've started to work more on health. The health of a population is related to you know, 
the uh, environmental factors that are out there, people's genetic materials, all kinds of interesting information. And we'd like to be able to read from that scientific literature and from electronic medical records and actually assemble that information in one place to try and make uh, better health outcomes. And that's something we've been doing for the last couple of years. And the last one is financial markets, uh, which is very good if you want to make money, uh, but it's not too interesting, and I'll tell you about some other time to do it. <laughs> so we'll talk more about climate and biodiversity, because it's one of the projects that we started in first. And you could rightly ask, you know, climate and biodiversity, was that the most pressing problem that you could think about? Maybe, maybe not. But the real reason was is that one of my really good friends was a biodiversity expert, a paleobiologist, and he was willing to suffer through our early prototypes for a couple of years. And the couple of years that we were doing was trying to answer this seemingly very naive question. Could we build a machine to read for us? And I don't mean read in the sense that the machine is going to be moved and have emotional responses to the scientific literature. I mean that it's going to suck in those bits, those bits that we have to do, OCR them if it has to, that is recognize the characters that are on the page, extract the information, the facts, the, the critters that are in there, the relationships that are in there, maybe the measurements about geochemical materials, and put that all in one uh, knowledge base or standard SQL database. Now, <coughs> this is an example of something that we would like to read. Okay. I don't expect you to read it, but this is the process that we're going through. <coughs> so the information we're actually after is buried in these tables or charts that are inside the PDF. That's actually the information that scientists, in some cases, care about. And I'll get back some hard numbers about how much data is in these tables. Now here we see that we have this fact that's expressed. Obora uh, is a location, and this genus, Moravalum acryus, is something that they found in that location. Now, more about Macrius is a kind of cockroach. If you love cockroaches, this is hot stuff. You want to know this, and you want to put it in your database. Okay? I don't love cockroaches, so I don't have that same emotional investment. Now, if you think about being able to figure out this association, and you know a bit about how machines work, you realize all the layered problems that one would have to solve to just even discover that there is a potential relationship between them. You'd have to do some OCR, some optical character recognition. You'd have to understand that relationships are sort of expressed visually in the page. And you'd have to deal with all kinds of low-level details about font faces and all kinds of strange, you know, looking scientific words that we wanted to extract perfectly and put that all together. Even if you manage to do that, though, there's another problem. You don't actually understand what OBORA stands for. It turns out that in our data set that we've produced, there are actually 40-something different places that are called OBORA on the map. And from looking at this, this OBORA string, we have absolutely no idea which one we're referring to. Now, it turns out, in this case, if we read the text of the article, this is actually the text, not the caption, that the Obora site, we actually can get the GPS coordinates of it. Pretty good. So we read, actually, the sentence, and we can actually see the Obora site is situated, blah, 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 blah. Here are the GPS coordinates, which resolves unambiguously which Obora we're talking about. I'll give you some stats in a second to suggest whether or not this is sort of a one-off phenomenon or something that actually happens quite a lot. But assuming we get that information, we can now resolve which Obora we're talking about put it on a map and really scientifically resolve it so that people can do further analysis. This is the type of problem that we want to solve in detail. Now, when this was first shown to me, uh, it was actually shown to me by one of my students, and one of the characteristics of my students is that they're much smarter than I am. So what he did is when he came in, he showed me this information, and he said, look, we have to build a system that can jointly reason across text and tables simultaneously if we're really going to get high quality in these domains. And me being the stupid advisor, I told him, I don't think we're going to build a whole system for this. This seems like a one-off occurrence. Uh, convince me that actually this is something that we need to invest in very heavily, you know, some number of months of your PhD. So here's what he did. So he said, okay, I'll do that. So we had some of these paleobiology collaborators, and he asked them to do the following very, very simple experiment. He took the text, the papers, and he broke them into three pieces. The whole document, the tables only, and the text only. So the same documents are broken into basically parallel corpora. Then he randomly bribed geoscientists, who are our friends and people we had already been working with for a couple years, and he randomly assigned them to look at individual versions of these of these of this corpus, so that someone would get a table-only copy, a whole document, a text only, and he would ask them to do the annotation task, which they would normally do on these papers, to extract this information. <coughs> so here are the results of this experiment. The first thing is the precision. Precision is, is uh, this is the precision, it's going to be all normalized to one. Because we have no idea if they're right or wrong, so we'll just normalize that to one, and they all agree with each other on these extraction tasks. The second and more interesting set of bars are the recall. That is, how many facts were they actually able to credibly extract from that information and resolve precisely? Now, what's not surprising even a little bit is that the 
ta text only and the table only are lower than the whole document. That is, if you read the entire document, you get out more facts. Not at all surprising. What was surprising, and what he argued, which was great in this ACL paper, was if you take the text and you take the tables and you stack the text on top of the tables, which would kind of say that they have no commonalities between them, if you like, more or less, then actually you're still 20% short of the final precision goal. And that's pretty interesting because it means that t humans need to, and this is a very rough statistic, but need to basically about 20% of the time sort of reason jointly across text and tables if you want to get all that data that's out there. And remember, we're interested in these macroscopic problems, and really the way we're judged is, can we get all the information that's inside those, those text articles? So if you're a probability nerd, then this will maybe resonate with you. Maybe you're a closet Bayesian, who knows? What we're talking about here is that we have to do joint probabilistic inference. That's actually what we're, we're doing underneath the covers. And some, my friend Ben Recht always likes to say we're, we're Bayesian up to the hyperparameters, and then he puts in a TM, which I don't really understand, but it's fine. <laughs> anyway, but what we're talking about here is the fact that we have to take in all of the available information and then do inference, and do it all in one way. Now, if you know how normal NLP systems work, they work in pipelines, where you first parse the sentence, then you do some extraction. There are long sequences of pipelines, so you get to the end relations you want. We don't do that in deep dive. Everything is one giant unholy soup that you declare that a user does. They have no idea in what order anything is executed, and that's going to put a huge burden on our system to be able to execute this, as I said, before the heat death of the universe. These are tough problems. Now, none of this is in the abstract. We actually built this thing. This is a system called Paleo Deep Dive. There are maybe tens of these systems that are built on the deep dive framework, and this is the first one and the one that got us that we sort of went into most deeply, so I'm going to share it with you. It's a student it's thesis, so it's thesis, and it's with uh, some collaborators in geoscience, Shannon Peters and Marone Libney. Uh, you'll see what Marone had to do here. If you know what Condor is, which is one of these large workflow systems, it's going to turn out that our first versions required millions of CPU hours, and Marone was the guy who provided those plumbing pipes for us to get this done. So here's what Paleo Deep Dive did. We want to build the highest covered fossil record uh, as possible from reading the literature. Now this may sound to you like something that should have already been done, but in fact it hasn't been. And I'll actually be able to show you, there's actually a hand-created database that they've been working on for two decades of people manually keystroking in. We found this fossil in this location. Right? That's, a, that's an amazing effort that they've been doing. 20 continuous person years of actually, we have the key logs, the logs of them entering in data to try and build this macroscopic database. So we're going to do this. Take in a bunch of PDFs, <coughs> wild PDFs, wherever they come from, we're going to try and produce this data set, which always my collaborators make fun of, which is this dinosaur. I like dinosaurs. They think it's stupid. Uh, but we're going to try and basically find all these fossils, where they are, when in time they were found, and what part of the taxonomic hierarchy they belong to. Right? So it's actually subjective when you look at a critter, where it goes in the tree of life. That's something that an expert makes a judgment. We're actually going to fill out a slightly more complicated data structure than that under the covers. But papers come in, data structure comes out. The way we're going to do this is a little bit strange. We're going to do everything, as I mentioned, by statistical inference. So we're going to view all of the text, all of the OCR software, as basically observations about the real world. And we're going to build a big model, probabilistic model, that's going to use those observations to predict the most likely dinosaur database, if you like, that results from those observations. All right. so this is extremely aggressive. Every character, word, part of speech can be a random variable that's either true or false. And so we're going to propose doing actually statistical inference on billions of variables. When we started this project, the frameworks that I'm talking about could handle tens of documents. And over the last years, with some very smart uh, students and a bunch of great research, uh, we can actually handle these billions or terabyte scale factor graphs. And that's what a lot of our you know, very you know, near and dear to my nerd heart research is about. But I won't bore you about that too much today. I may sneak in one or two slides because I can't resist. Anyway, so we're going to do this. Now, if you've ever played with AI stuff, you may say, well, you're going to do this, but you're going to get some kind of crappy quality out. You're going to do this, and it's going to be lower quality, and no one's really going to be able to use it, and maybe it's a nice exercise. So we wanted to actually evaluate and see, can we produce a useful artifact for scientists to use? So this is where the PaleoDB comes in. So PaleoDB is human created. This is 330 volunteers, uh, 13 years, it's actually about 15 now, that they've been entering data in. As I mentioned, 20 continuous person years of just keystroking in data. They've read 46,000 documents, and they're filling out basically a SQL database with that. They're up to about 50,000 now. This is brutal work. Read a paper, write down all the facts that are inside. This has been transformative for their area. 200 papers use these macroscopic way of viewing the world, and 17 of those landed in places like Nature or Science, which if you're a paleobiologist, not a computer scientist, that's what you brag to your friends about. Okay. 
that. So they're like, oh, I got an major in science paper. That's awesome. Right? So this is very big for them. Now, they have all these people working on this. And we thought, well, we'll put a grad student on it, right? He's a smart CS grad student. What could go wrong? <laughs> so we built Paleo Deep Dive. So we turned it on. We did a lot of tuning. We did a lot of validation. Actually, writing the code wasn't too bad. Doing the validation that I'll talk about was monstrous. When we turned it on, we got 10x more documents than they had been able to annotate. So from 50,000 to 500,000. It's a machine. It doesn't get tired. You can just feed it as many documents as you like. You may ask rightly, are there only 500,000 documents? Is that all that they care about in this domain? And it turns out the answer is no. But we can't get access to them because of publishers, and I'll spare you my rant about that. So we got about 10x more documents than they have there. What's more interesting is in that 10x more documents, we got 100-fold more extractions. So that means basically per document, we're getting an order of magnitude more information than the humans are actually able to extract. When you go back and do the error analysis, the answer is quite obvious. Like People get bored. Like You don't want to annotate all of the tables that occur in the appendix of some document. You don't even want to do all the text. The way I sometimes glibly summarize this is if you're the world experts in snails, and there's a bunch of facts about whales, well, who cares about those whale guys? They're a bunch of hacks anyway. I'm going to get the snail stuff and put that in the database, and market is done. Now, being that's way too glib for what's actually going on, but you don't want people doing this. You would prefer that a machine was able to systematically go through and get as many occurrences as possible and put those in a database. And that's what that inference problem is doing. Now, the second question you have if you're a sort of machine learning AI type is, OK, fine, your recall's high, but maybe you're just returning a bunch of junk. We're not, but let's get to that. The question is the precision. When we put a tuple in the database through this insane you know, big factor graph and we infer it with some high confidence, is it actually highly confident? Are we actually able to produce a large number of tuples? So this thing formation is actually the key element. Do we get the right place on the map, that Obora resolution that I was talking about? Can we figure out where we're actually talking about, where this, this uh, uh, critter actually is? It's a more subtle thing. It can be in the title. It can be in the text. We have to do that inference. Now, the first question we ask is, how good are humans at doing this? seems like a natural thing to ask. And so this is what took my student quite a lot of time, is he actually went through the volunteers and he had them route their tuples to experts. So he took the volunteer tuples, gave them to, to experts, which took a while to get the experts to look at them. And then they rated whether or not they thought the extractions were correct. And there's a long, elaborate protocol for how we did this to try and eliminate biases and how we showed people things and in what order. And basically, we found that humans were accurate about 84% of the time at doing this simple task of resolving where it is on the map. Now, when you dig into that 84%, those 16% of errors, you may ask, where are these errors coming from? Are they typo errors? Or are they just kind of sloppy errors? It turns out that a significant fraction of them are what I would call insidious errors, where someone has some background knowledge where they say, this formation isn't called by that name anymore, or this time period has been shortened or elongated. And I'm going to use my background information to infer and put in a different value in the database that I'm reading in the text. Now, this is great if, you're, if their background knowledge is better than what's in the text. But if it's not, right? so if they're, if they're looking there and they've made some mistake, then it's lost to the ages. And that's in the sense that I mean it's insidious. They put it in the database, and God knows what happens. You'll never be able to track that error down. In contrast, our system is stupid. It makes systematic errors. It's the same errors every time. You can retrain it and run the entire process, not in two decades, <coughs> which you could never imagine rerunning. But you can rerun this in an afternoon. And so not surprisingly, our precision is dramatically higher. It's in the 90s. And I would use this to argue that basically for these extraction and knowledge-based construction tasks, which seemed out of our reach even a couple of years ago, we've gotten to the point where the AI and statistical inference underneath the covers is critical to getting high recall and high precision here and being able to obviate the need to, for humans to look at some of this data. Now, we didn't just build a dinosaur finder. That's not what we were after. Uh, we've actually built a couple of other things. And this is one thing where I, you know, my heart bleeds the same as the, as the preceding speaker. We want to help accelerate science as well. And so we've been working with a bunch of people on these tree of life extractions. I can tell you more about other ways we're recognizing taxonomy. I can tell you a little bit about uh, drug repurposing that we've been doing over time, trying to figure out the interactions of various drugs in the literature. We just launched a major project about genomics that will be public in a couple weeks, where we've been extracting uh, genomic and genetic information from the uh, scientific literature. And in all these cases, we're actually able to meet or sometimes exceed human volunteers in terms of quality using these same techniques. They're literally the same programs in some cases, substituted with different, with different dictionaries or ontology. There's not too much that you swap to do relation extraction from one domain to another. And in fact, we've won competitions, the big TAP competitions. We win using essentially the same approach. 
Also, one thing that I'm super excited about and has been on the news recently, but I doubt anyone here has seen it. I shouldn't make fun of 60 Minutes because they were nice to put us on. I doubt there are many 60 Minutes watchers here. Uh, we've been doing some stuff with anti-human trafficking. And so you may think uh, this only applies to scientific literature because those are who we play with the most. But actually, there's a bunch of work about tracking down uh, people who are in forced labor, uh, essentially. So this is a nasty business where people are forced into prostitution or forced into working low-paying jobs. And that information is actually surfaced on the internet in various ways. And Deep Dive is one of the things that's going through and extracting information from those ads and other service requests and putting them into a structured database for law enforcement. And this was covered on a recent episode of 60 Minutes and also in a bunch of other news outlets. The thing that's conceptually important is that this is a totally different domain. There's not a scientist in the background hand curating the great sex trafficking database. They don't actually even have one. We have to bootstrap and create that database as we go. And that's really exciting to us because that means we can go beyond this, what we call knowledge-based completion, where you have a database and you're expanding it, to actually knowledge-based creation, where you can start with text and bootstrap and create knowledge essentially out of the text that you're giving. And that's what we've been doing for the last couple of months. One thing that I wanted to plug here uh, before going on is that we have a bunch of what we call open data sets. These are all public. To create the first versions of these data sets requires sometimes millions of CPU hours. Anything that's Creative Commons that you have can get your paws on and you want us to process, send it over. We have millions of CPU hours. And then we post it online. As long as we can post it publicly, we're very, very happy to work on it. So it's all in this open data URL. And it's basically all the scientific literature that we can get our hands on. Um, and a bunch of museum collections and more data is coming in all the time. So definitely send us in. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit just of how this thing works at a very high and super, admittedly superficial level. The entire point is that this thing, we're going to think about features and not algorithms. You actually cannot write an algorithm in deep stuff. You can't do it. You want to use an SVM? Too bad. You want to use you know, low rank factorization? Go use somebody else's system. For us, what you're going to write down are the features of the model. Basically, if you're a real AI nerd, what we're doing is forcing you to declare templated graphical models. That's the way this works. It looks like something like a Markov logic or a PRM underneath the covers and differs only in the really nerd details. <coughs> so the way these pipelines work is that you acquire data. This is actually <coughs> quite expensive. Then what you do is you run state-of-the-art NLP on it. You just run every tool you can get your hands on and treat those as the observations. Chris Manning et al. have done a great job, and many other people too, but we use Stanford NLP. And we run these, these tools over the corpora, and they take sometimes you know, 4 million CPU hours, so 450 CPU years. It's quite a bit of processing. What we get out of that are these structured sentences. Basically, the sentences are diagrammed, the NERs are tagged, the named entities are tagged. We've done co-reference. We've figured out which pronouns refer to what. And we've built a large structure, if you like. This is our observation. Then the magic happens. Statistical stuff. We'll talk briefly about this. And then it gets surfaced to some kind of web uh, processing infrastructure. Now the part that we're giving away essentially are these first two chunks. So if you're interested in, in having and starting sort of here at where Deep Dive takes over, we can do that. We can give you that. Okay? And people have that. All right, so let's look a little bit here. So how do they actually do this step? There's tutorials online. People have gone through them and not sent us murderous rage emails. That's the bar we set in our group very high. Uh, so they seem to be happy, and lots of collaborators are using them. It turns out that scientists are in a tremendous amount of pain, so they will spend five months to be able to sit down and learn how to get better than human quality. Um, the first deployments usually take a couple of months. Then they would routinely, after that, it's one month sort of for a new uh, kind of extraction, once you learn how everything works together. But it is still a steep upfront investment. So how does it work? Well, the user tells us all kinds of things. They tell us things like, here's a dictionary of places. They express that to us by giving us a table and telling us that it's a dictionary with a little bit of syntactic goo. They may have a little program that, taken and given a string and given some context words, fires it off against a web service backend and says, from these, these, this location name, tell us the lat long. So for example, the Census Bureau has some similar kind of API that you can use to figure out which MSA you're in, which you know, metropolitan statistical area you're in. And we can use those kinds of information. You write the glue code. You also may tell us some words that you think indicate a relationship, some little bits of training data. It turns out that we actually ignore your training data, which may be disturbing to you. We use it to basically produce reports of how well we're doing. We can come back to that point a little bit later, using a technique that we call distance supervision. So how does the user actually do it? Well, so this is just to be concrete. I'm going to give you a very low-level setup. You want to infer things like US President Barack Obama's wife, Michelle Obama, honored all mothers on Mother's Day and offered her thoughts. And what we want to infer from the sentence, just because we're having a little exercise, is that Barack Obama is indeed married to Michelle Obama. When we read the sentence, it's because of this possessive, you know, Obama's wife. Right? 
So this is what we have. That preprocessing looks something like this. It's a sentence broken into a bunch of tokens. The part of speech, we have the noun phrases, the verbs, all the interesting stuff that's in there. We have the NER tags, what's a person, place, or thing. Okay. And now what we're going to do is what we call candidate extraction and feature extraction. Candidate extraction says we're going to try and find all candidates to be married. People aren't usually married to places. I guess sort of metaphorically people can be married to their jobs, but we don't mean that. Really. So we're going to find all the people in the sentences, and we're going to make those that occur potentially together as candidates. It's just a Python script you would write, maybe a SQL query. Then we're going to try and infer this weird thing that's called has spouse for historical reason, which is a random variable that says whether or not they're indicated to be married by this sentence. That's all it really means. And then we're going to attach features to this pair of tuples that we're looking at, this pair of uh, mentions that we're looking at. <coughs> okay? And so the kind of features we would want are something like, does it have a possessive wife in between them? Okay? Now this, from this feature, we can learn anytime we see that pattern, or whatever pattern we see between these people, again and again, we can learn over time which ones are the ones that are likely to be married and which ones are not. And that's basically it. They express that they think the words on the sentence between them are likely to be uh, indicative of whether or not they participate in some relationship. And we have a library called Deep Dive Library, very imaginatively, that you can run and it does basically the stock features for you and tries to learn those patterns, those uh, parts of the sentence that are going to be able to infer whether or not someone has spouse from very limited training data. Okay, and so here's some glossy way. It's actually SQL under the covers. We have a data log-like language that you can use. This is, this is the rule that you write. You can go through the examples and see that you can compile these pieces of code. The likelihood is tied across features. If you're a stats nerd, it means that the weights are shared or tied in some way. You tell us what factors influence your decision, the words in the sentence, whatever they are. And there's no reference to algorithms. So if you look at any of the programs, no prop algorithms, just features. Just indicating the relationship, setting up the random variables, setting up the correlations. And Deep Dive does all the rest, all the regularization, all the other stuff that you need to do. And there are demos of this online. And the reason this is so, I argue, conceptually significant for, from our point of view is that now you don't need a PhD in stats to understand what's going on under the covers. You can operate metaphorically by, you know, oh, it, need, it doesn't know. The people talk about it like it's a human. It doesn't know this distinction, so I had to add in this dictionary. I had to add in this set of features or this little regular expression to differentiate these two classes. And that's the way that people interact with this system. Now, a more subtle point is what happens when it goes wrong. So it's great when it works. Everyone's happy when it works. No one complains. We don't hear back from them for a while. Um, but what, how do they debug it and understand what's going on? So one of the things that we discovered right away is if you take algorithms away from people, they have a very difficult time understanding what the heck is going on. Because an algorithm is a powerful way to understand the sequence of steps that you're going to produce the data from. So how do we do it? We use these things called calibration plots. And basically what we're able to do is define what the answers mean independently of how we compute them. If you're a database nerd, then basically this is like algorithmic independence. We can say what the answer is without having to tell you how we compute it. We think that's a very, very important property of such systems. So what does that mean operationally? So this is a, this is a plot we produce. For every relation that's extracted, you can see these plots online. The x-axis is the output probability. This is the score that Deep Dive assigns to every random variable that it sees, the marginal probability. On the y-axis is the accuracy. Ideally, if Deep Dive is behaving well, everything is going to be on this ideal line. That is, the probability that we report is actually proportional to the accuracy. Let me be a little bit more concrete. This is an actual calibration plot. If I go into point 8, then I would expect roughly 80% Right, of the facts that are in that 0.8 bucket to be correct. So when I look at that information, I can see those are the 80% facts. Okay. And that property should hold, that calibration property should hold, basically independently of how I compute it. And if you look online and you do this, this may seem like a very mysterious property, and in some ways it very, very much is. You can see how we enforce calibration. And this is the way that people read out from their data what's going on. Now when they look at this, they say, okay, it's working, I can convince myself it's sort of correct, those numbers that are produced. But how do I debug it? So this is another graph that's produced, which is the output probability. And then here's a histogram, the number of extractions that are in every bucket. This is an unbelievably easy extractor, because as you can see, the output to users is most of the candidates we're considering. Remember, we defined those candidates, and then these are the ones that are all above 0.9. The characteristic function for these guys looks like a big U, where you have lots of things at 0.9 and lots of things at 0, if everything's working well. If everything's in a big mass around 0.5, your extractor is genuinely confused. You're missing features. So for example, here, if we look at this 0.5 bump, which is not at all uncommon, 
That's where you would jump in and add more features to distinguish those classes if you cared about the aggregate sort of value. If you cared about just getting a few more extractors, you may jump into the point .8 bucket and see what are those things that you just need a little bit more information to bump them to the higher probability that you can output to the users. And this is how people write deep dive programs. And they never, ever understand the algorithms that are underneath the covers. We won't let them. We don't even tell them what we do. So what this suggests is that it may be possible to think about features and not algorithms using probability theory. We do everything, everything by probability theory. Everything is just an application of Bayes' rules that got way out of hand. Uh, and that's what we're doing. And so this allows them to never understand, never have to worry about clustering this or SVM that or deep learning this. They're just probabilities. Interact with them and understand. Now, what we've been trying to do is get them broadly usable. That first demo took two years. Most of the time was validation that the thing actually worked. In about six months, a bioengineering student, she's not in uh, CS, actually was able to get Forma Deep Dive up and running and to the level of quality where it was saturated and she was actually doing analysis on top of it. So the whole thing that we've been doing research on, and I won't beat this too much, there's a bunch of fun math that we can do under the covers, is to try and make this process as fast and easy as possible. Recommend features to you, make the debugging cycle interactive, all that good nerd mathematical programming stuff that you either never took or didn't like, probably, but we love. And that's what we do. And so we've, we've basically built an entire framework that's gone on here. It uses all kinds of fancy math tricks under the covers to make this as interactive as possible. And that's, that's a lot of technical work to try and make this, as I said, as soon as you give it information, we want it to come back. We are far from this goal right now, but that's what we're, what we're going to is a really interactive system. And that's what we're working on. So there's a problem still, which is to get rid of these algorithms, we need a blazingly fast engine. I told you we're going to do inference on factor graphs that are uh, terabytes in size. And that may sound insane to you if you've ever done you know, give sampling on a terabyte scale factor graph. That sounds like you're going to need billions of machines to do this. I don't know how you would think to do it. We're going to do it on one machine, because we're insane and we like doing things on one big machine. And what is our approach to do this? Well, we're going to let the hardware do the work. So it turns out if you haven't opened a machine in the last like five or six years, they've gotten awesome inside. I don't know another way to describe it. The machines that you can buy today for twenty dollars or $30,000 have tens of cores inside them that they process, big beefy cores. They have terabytes of RAM. They are big, serious, serious machines. You can buy those and stick them in, you know, under your desk and then do all kinds of crazy stuff on top. And so that's what we're going to do is figure out how can we exploit modern hardware to be able to, to solve these inference problems. Now I'll skip over the math a little bit. If, it's, if you know it, great. If not, don't worry. I'll explain what you need to know from it. Basically, a lot of machine learning can basically be written as writing an optimization of a function like this. You have a minimize over some x. x is a vector that lives in some space, like rd for some small dimension d. You have a bunch of n examples, and you're minimizing some loss. Okay? Basically, this is how you know, things like classification, recommendation, even deep learning can be phrased as one of these minimization problems. That transforms this from a problem in statistics and modeling to one in optimization. And that's what we're going to solve underneath the coverage. The way you solve these equations, or how people have decided to over the last couple of years, which is an old method that goes back to the 50s, is this thing called stochastic gradient descent. Stupidest algorithm you can imagine, stupid is good. So what it does is it grabs a single term from that expression, it computes the gradient, it estimates the gradient, so the gradient is the direction of maximal increase. It wants to minimize it, so it walks in the opposite direction. That's all it does, billions and billions of times. This is the gradient of f at xk for some yj example. And it just repeats this process a billion times. Okay. So select one term and estimate the gradient. Now computing that gradient is super fast. It's like hundreds of cycles on a modern processor. It's in nanoseconds. It's just ridiculously fast. So we have a problem. Billions and billions of really, really tiny, tiny iterations that we're going to try and execute. And we're going to want to take advantage of the fact that the machine has 50 or 60 cores, but they're all running really fast doing this iteration. So how do we do it? So if we look at this, this is insane. There's a, if you remember your CS, there are read-write conflicts here. I'm going to have to read X and then write back to it. So if I just took all the processes and run them in parallel, they'll all be stepping on each other. If I do something sane like put in locking and make sure that I synchronize so that they're going to have a serial order, they're actually just going to spend their time locking and waiting for each other to get access to their few components of X before they write it back. So if we want to speed this up with parallelism, it looks hopeless. You know, the classical notions from computer science, like serializability, just seem like they're, they're not appropriate at all to be able to speed this up. And if you try and implement it, you'll not get any speed up if you try and implement it with locks and latches and all the rest. So what genius idea did we have? Uh, it was my student's idea, as always. Well, we're going to comment out of the locks. 
So we're going to take all the locks in the program and we're just going to let basically the, the system race underneath the covers. So everyone's going to be have a free for all and they're all going to write to each other and we're going to let the hardware sort it out and it's going to satisfy some kind of consistency property and we'll see what happens. It's statistical anyway, who cares? Well, it turns out that actually we can prove theorems. And we prove an embarrassing number of these theorems, uh, so I'll spare you all the details. The one to pay attention to is the first one, which we called hog wild, and I gave it this annoying exclamation mark, which I'm very proud of, which will come up in a slot. Uh, and then we have some others. Async SED was actually G. Lu, and he's much more sensible, so he wanted async SED. And then uh, recently my student Chris saw actually proved that these stochastic methods could even work for non-convex functions in a very limited, restricted setting, which is super cool. Lots of technical stuff here. If you're interested, definitely follow up with me. I'm happy to tell you how these things work. We, we love them. We can't stop working them. But the high-level idea is very simple. We let the hardware race, and we try and just make sure that it's uh, statistically correct. And we prove theorems, and uh, you know, many companies actually use this. It's actually used on the web in various places. And as you'll see, I'll show you one of these frameworks, these deep learning frameworks actually publicly uses these things. Many of them do. So here's one thing I thought was very funny. Uh, I love this headline because it's the stupidest and hypiest headline I can imagine. It says, AI breakthrough, Microsoft's project Adam identifies dog breeds, points to future of machine learning. So if you remember, Google recognized cats, Microsoft recognizes dogs. Uh, that's a Windows phone, which I'm sure there are many in the audience right now, so just hold up your Windows phone. Uh, you can then take a picture of the dog, and then it says that's a shit too. Awesome. That is kind of awesome. I got to say, even though I'm making fun of it, it is kind of awesome. So everybody has something that looks like this in their pipelines. Baidu has one. Andrew's been, done a bunch of great work there. Uh, doing things like image recognition, voice, mobile, search. They're all building these kinds of big pipelines. And Project Atom was their deep learning pipeline that, that Microsoft was building. The reason I'm bringing it up to you is just mainly to tell a joke and a troll, which is that the article from Wired said, they use a technology called, of all things, hog wild. Now, every time I read this quote, it makes me laugh. Because first, they got the exclamation point, which I was extremely happy. That was the first note I said to them. was like, you got the exclamation point. And also, the writer expressed that she was completely incredulous that anything serious could actually be called hog wild, of all things hog wild. Like, thank god, we trolled the universe. Life is all right. So this is the things that we, we basically built. And we've been working on putting those inside deep dive for the last couple of years. Okay? All right. So is this a larger trend? I would argue yes. Uh, lots of people use them. We've, these are people who have contacted us and told us they're using some or all of our tools. Uh, we've relaxed this consistency relaxation to be more architecturally aware. You can actually go many more layers down. You don't have to just let everything be a free-for-all. You can change the ordering underneath to try and take better advantage of the hardware. I'm a big fan of stupid names because we spent all day in the lab and it makes my students laugh. So one other thing that I'll point out is this thing called dim-witted. That's a memory chip right there. Uh, I love saying the dim-witted engine, and I love when we beat other people and we're like, oh, it's the dim-witted engine's faster than us. Good. Anyway, so what the key idea of this is, is that we can play these reordering games. So when you do stochastic gradient descent, you can imagine they're totally random access, very difficult for the machine to optimize for, horrible locality. What if we change the access pattern so that it took advantage of some of the, the numinous, if you like, the non-uniform memory access that are under these machines? We may, gave it slightly better cache behavior. If you do that, you may change some of the statistical properties of the algorithm. So it's not clear. There's this non-obvious trade-off between what the hardware wants and what the statistics want. And so we call this the balance between statistical and hardware efficiency. And we tried to characterize it in a recent DLDB paper and showed where different models and different setups sort of fall on this curve. And it's a way to think about, if you're building one of these engines, where you should put your effort and how you should build it. Okay. I'll skip over this a little bit. This is, by the way, a big deal, we think, not a small deal, in the sense that this is 100x faster than things like MLlib on Spark or GraphLab. You know, even more in some situations, you can check out the paper. Those numbers have been validated by people. You can see it's a big deal that this AC, you can be asynchronous under the engines. It's orders of magnitude you're potentially leaving on the table. If you've seen this, there's been this steady stream of blog posts, one from a guy named Frank McSherry in a particular area, saying, my laptop's faster than your cluster. Right? I don't know if you've seen this great post. Frank's a great guy. Anyway, but if you look at those things, you see that the modern hardware that's inside a box frees you from a bunch of problems. But the problems that people like Spark and GraphLab are solving are monstrously difficult and hard problems. If you don't have to solve them, you can go much, much faster. There's nothing free that's going on here. We just don't have to be fault tolerant. So we can go much, much faster. And we can also optimize for the details of how these hardware systems work. All right. Uh, people are using it in other locations. I'll spare you how they use it. Improving performance, decreasing communication, energy efficiency, dealing with failures. And a very cool one is exploiting new hardware. That's the one that comes to my office that I think is most cool, is how do you take advantage of these new hardware substrates that are out there? I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So uh, 
it has come out with that system for calls and things like so. Yeah. And then traditionally, uh, researchers use uh, the GPUs to yeah. compete. So uh, in, in terms of the, the, the new model calls use versus, do you see advantage of the? That is such a phenomenal setup, I can't believe it. Give me three slides and I'll come right back to you. I'm exactly going to talk about this today. And uh, basically, I'm just going to be uh, annoying about it. And then we can have a substantial discussion after I'm annoying. But absolutely the right question, exactly where I'm headed. Right? What happens with this heterogeneous hardware? So to get there, I want to talk a bit about the application that motivates this question in particular that we've been building. Like what's going on with CPUs versus GPUs? And I'll talk a little bit about some stuff that we've been doing there. So one thing is, as I talked about, we've been doing a lot of stuff on the text side. Extract a bunch of information from text and put it in a knowledge base. But there's all this awesome information in images. Medical images, uh, there's satellite photos, there's all kinds of stuff that we really want to do image processing on and understand images more deeply and fuse it with the knowledge we've developed about the domain. And so that's one of the directions that we're, we're going actively right now. How do you put those together? And it's very funny, we, we thought this was kind of a quirky thing to do that you know, when we started this thing about a year ago, but every time we talk to someone who has these problems, 10 minutes after they get finished telling you about the text problem, they have an image problem. It's miraculous. Companies, scientists, they always have images around. It's, it's pretty interesting to me. But I am a neophyte. Maybe obvious to a lot. Okay? So examples are, you know, we want to recognize things like fossils. What kind of dinosaur is this? In our medical applications, we want to take pictures of patients and recognize different phenotypes or disorders. Um, we want to understand if the starfish is sick. I don't know why, but we do. And it turns out we actually want to do OCR better because it's hard. Yes, please. Professor, I have a philosophical question. Sure. Do you think uh, uh, intelligence is being built upon creativity or knowledge? Uh, being built up on creativity? Uh, yeah, or knowledge. Uh, yeah, so and I if think... you look at uh, Albert Einstein, yeah. like, uh, uh, you know, several decades ago when he invented relativity <coughs> theory, he does, did not have, you know, a press or lock up too, too many papers or books. He just sat there, used a pen, and he came up with a genius idea. You know, sure, that's, that's great. That's creativity, right? Yeah, so that's great. This has nothing to do with creativity. We're not in any way trying to replicate or do any of those things. No, I We're mean, just observing that for a... Artificial intelligence or intelligence is being built upon creativity or not. Well, I mean, that's one way to view the universe. This is a debate that rages on for you know, a long while. Um, is this one component of that, in, of that reasoning and infrastructure? Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? To me, I don't care. To me, honestly, what we're doing is solving hard problems, and we're using statistical inference for them. It's an interesting question to think about. So <clears throat> for us, we want to do this image processing because we have specific tasks. Diagnostic tasks, uh, you know, taxa taxonomy, which is actually a difficult task, that we like to merge together. And so of course, as everyone else does for image processing, we're going to do some combinational neural networks, which are one of the great workloads for GPUs that we heard about just a little bit ago. So here's where we come to the CPUs versus GPUs. So if you haven't been following this debate, it's been raging in the literature between different sides. There are people who say, you know, GPUs are absolutely critical to doing convolutional neural networks. And there's good reasons to believe that argument. There are also other major web companies who say, we do everything with CPUs. Microsoft is an example of one of those companies. And they fight back and forth. I don't care, I'm an academic, I just think it's interesting. But one thing that we realized in our lab is that we don't have truckloads of GPUs to do these things. We do have truckloads of CPUs that we've built for various reasons. So could we repurpose them for this? When we started digging into there, we, we dig into something and we notice something. So if you look on EC2, and I look at an in instance like an extra large instance, it gives me about 7 tenths of a teraflop, okay? floating point operations per second. A GPU, the same one on from EC2, there are better CPUs and GPUs, gives me about 1.2 teraflops. That's the installs that they have right now. But if you look into the literature, people will say that this thing runs uh, convolutional neural networks run 10x slower on the CPU than the GPU. And that seems strange to me. I mean, the flops seem like, you know, it's not a 10x gap here. Clearly it should be faster on the GPU, but not by an order of magnitude. So we looked at this pretty carefully with some friends and uh, from various companies. And we actually built a version of convolutional neural networks that runs on CPUs and GPUs to try and understand this trade-off. And in particular, in ImageNet with AlexNet, which was one of the benchmarks, what we showed is that the CAFE GPU is up here, delivering end-to-end -end throughput, a little bit of, of half a teraflop on this instance. Its CPU is way down here in terms of its teraflops. Our CPU instance is about 5x faster than their CPU instance. And if we combine two CPUs, we get roughly the performance of a GPU. Now, it's still cheaper to buy GPUs for this setup that we have here. It's still ch cheaper on Amazon to run them on GPUs. But the gap is in 10x. It's not magical. It's really flop-driven. Right? It's the roofline model. If you remember your architecture course and you remember Patterson and Hennessy, and if you don't, look it up. It's a great book. 
uh, there's the roof line model. You cannot escape it. You're either bandwidth bound or flop bound. And you can push these things so that they're flop bound. And if they're flop bound, then the flop should be proportional when you schedule it. Okay? Now what's also nice is that we can use both the CPU and the GPU at the same time. So you can have a GPU instance and use the CPUs instead of just sitting idly there to actually do some portion of the computation. And it turns out we can get a little bit of proportional scheduling. It's a 20% speed up. The CPUs on these instances are relatively weak. But this is clearly teasing at a direction. We're not trying to replace CAFE. We love CAFE. Trevor's awesome. All we're trying to point out is that there are these interesting trade-offs of being able to run on heterogeneous backends. It needn't be a religious war. We can just run on whatever we have. We should be able to do a good job. So we released a software. It's up there. Uh, it's called CAFE Control. We uh, knock off of CAFE, so we wanted to be very <laughs> explicit about that. Uh, the paper is, the little short paper is released. It's called Shallow Ideas to Speed Up Deep Learning. It's very shallow ideas, very simple systems ideas, very simple HPC ideas that are classical. If you read, you know, architecture books or database books. It has to do with, if you're very technical about this, it has to do with the way you do the lowering. You take a four-dimensional tensor, and you basically decompose it into a bunch of matrix multiplies. That's what happens in the convolutional layers. To speed that up, there are several ways of doing that rewrite that depend on the hardware. It depends how you batch, how you assign locality groups to do this, and it depends on how you block the SIMD registers inside the CPU. Uh, and it turns out that if you can do that, you get those speed ups that we talked about from before. What we're doing now are things what we call fusion, which is this classical optimization, which is to fuse across these different layers. Pretty much everyone calls into a matrix multiply library, but there's a waste of doing that. You have to materialize, call the thing, do it back. Could you materialize and compile the entire deep learning core to do this? And it looks like you'll get about 60% faster if you do that. So the thing for us is we just want to make use of everything. So the question is CPUs versus GPUs, we don't care. One data point is that the CPUs are getting wider and wider stimulants. And those wider simulators are very cheap to put down. In a couple years, will CPUs catch up with GPUs? I don't know. If the market's big enough, maybe Intel decides to make the Cindy line wide enough to compete with GPUs. Uh, if GPUs get a huge head start and build out and those guys have their way, maybe GPUs carry the day. For us, we just want to use both. So whatever the, the technology is. And they're basically very simple techniques under each one. Does that answer the question? Um, yeah, I have a question to make sure. Actually, I, I said you all the time, but I did see if I guess I can put it up. Yeah, but, but, um, we, we literally posted it this morning. It's, oh, it's no, in the one that's yeah. That's why I couldn't find it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so uh, two, two quick questions. Sure. One is that, uh, is it easy for you to uh, allocate percentage of jobs uh, towards the, the GPU versus the CPU? Do you have to do a lot of <laughs> uh, No, that's a great question. So we built this abstraction that allows us to be able to go over both of them seamlessly and just build a simple proportional schedule. That's what we get up. But we don't have the same problem like a web company would have where we have hundreds of CPUs and thousands of GPUs and whatever it is. We have a small number of CPUs and GPUs and a relatively easy, what we call, proportional scheduling problem. We measure the flops <coughs> up front, what they can deliver, and then we schedule based on their total share of flops, and that does about as good as anything. We, we sweep the parameter space and we're not off by too much doing this. When we scale out to many different machines, then life gets more interesting, and that's, that's something we're going to work on in the next couple months. But I just did want to bring it up because it's something that my students posted actually just a little while ago. It's a great question. Um, just really quickly, right. the, in the, the teraflops number, is, right. it's the SIMD operations that get you there. Yeah, exactly. In the, in the CPU. Exactly. It's, so Intel has put two things into their chips recently. One is wider SIMD length, single instruction, multiple data. So every clock cycle, you can do multiplications of four things. They also put in something there called the fuse multiply and add. And the fuse multiply and add actually allows you to do two operations per clock cycle per SIMD register. And it's when you put all those things together, the fuse yeah. multiply and add, that you get up to those teraflop numbers. It turns out, I'm going to just nerd out on this. No one, it, no one can listen to me. I don't care. I love this stuff. It turns out that what, it's very cheap to put those down for energy considerations. So those lanes have been doubling each processor generation for the last four. The lanes are getting wider. The fuse multiply and adds are coming in. The next, the Skylake is even wider, uh, which is the next one that's coming out. So those things are happening that they're able to get more Cindy from them. Are they catching up with GPUs? Well, no, and yes, and maybe. Who knows? But um, we'll see what happens. But we want to take advantage of all of this. Great, great question. All right, so this is one thing I thought it would be fun kind of troll to talk about because everyone loves deep learning. We do too. It's great we use it. All right, so getting back to the, oh, please. I have a question somewhat really with that question uh -huh. over there. Uh, do you think uh, inference could be done in a way that you had a, uh, like a, either a skeptical or a cynical text uh -huh. and be able to actually infer a uh, great question in a kind of a joke? Yeah, yeah. So one, one question uh, that was brought up actually in the, in the earlier talk, which I think was great, and I was really expecting this question is, can you tell the quality of the sources? Can you tell whether they're being deliberately misleading? Can you tell that kind of information? 
And by and large, the answer is really no. We are not doing that right now. But one of the projects that we've launched, which is coming up in the genomics literature, inspired by a lot of the same ideas that were there, is to measure the quality of the text that's there in a very rough metric sense. And there are some models that one can write down that do a better job than not doing anything whatsoever. But it's an area of very active research. So both text that is unintentionally misleading, which is what we're dealing with now, and what you're talking about, which is either being sarcastic or misleading, right. which there's been some great work on, but it's not something we've worked on. Which, which basically tells me that in that paper they had about domain specific languages, yep. eventually you want to teach the scientists to write in a very formal way so inference can be efficient. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to constrain the way they write so that we can actually get enough structure of the problem to make inference efficient. And what we're trying to do is find those other modules about quality and reasoning that we can abstract away that they can basically use like Lego blocks to build up their programs. We don't have a way to do that now. Deep dive you can think about as like a risk processor. You can express your inference problem, essentially whatever it is, have to satisfy certain completeness properties. But getting it to do what you want is a non-trivial exercise. So a lot of the computer science research is like, you know, it's like we're building a C compiler. It's a risk processor and we're trying to build a language on top of it that is actually useful and hides some of the details of like, you know, register allocation or whatever the stuff that you have to do under the covers in C. We're going to try and do the same thing for statistics. And that's what we've been doing for the last couple of years. But what I was referring to though is uh -huh. not to teach people how to write programs for doing inference. Right. I was referring to uh, influence the way that scientists are writing papers. So this automatic oh. knowledge discovery can be more efficient. Yeah, let me say it in a, in a more aggressive way even. So one of the things when I first started this project, my colleague said is, it's going to be really depressing if all the scientists start actually putting up their data in SQL databases. Like, you're going to be out of a job. This is a risky bet for you. Uh, it turns out that scientists, by and large, are pretty lazy uh, when it comes to being a <laughs> uh, So we're betting on that for the short term. Um, you know, there have been, a, you know, over the last 10 or 15 years, there have been a number of these efforts that say, put your data in this format, and then we're going to share it. And they go by you know, semantic web link data, whatever it is. By and large, those, effort, those efforts have not been wildly successful. They've had some targeted successes. But they haven't taken over. Um, for us, why we're studying these problems is that it, it's a really hard statistical inference problem. We actually don't care about NLP all that much. It's just the hardest inference problem that we can find. And all of our papers are about solving that inference problem. Um, but it's such an awesome and compelling mode of, uh, application that we spend a lot of our cycles on. But you're exactly right. Any other oh, please. So I'm just curious, how do you scale your system? Because I believe you are definitely not cloning uh, another IBM uh, Watson, right? Uh -huh. And uh, when I me when I uh, mean uh, scale set by by scaling a system, I mean L3 is single layers, algorithm layer, uh -huh. software software architecture layer, as well as hardware architecture layer. You touch hardware architecture layer a little bit, uh -huh. but you now look at you know you use SQL database. SQL database itself is not scale. Well, I mean, scale so of I mean, course you can use use heavy so machine. Well, I mean. Maybe yes or no. I mean, a couple of years ago, everyone was saying that SQL was going to go away and MapReduce was going to replace it, and Hadoop, which is one of, was founded by a, co a very good friend of mine, uh, it was going to replace everything. And fast forward to today, you look at Cloudera, they're selling basically SQL databases on top. So the SQL language itself is something that people love. The binaries that were you know, coming out from DB2 and Formix and the rest, no one really likes because they have transaction processing and all the rest of them. But it's a very nice logical language that there are orders of magnitude more programmers for than any other language, uh, any other statistical language I'm aware of. So we're just trying to be able to take that language and scale it up. And theoretically, it actually is a scalable language. Uh, there are implementations of it that don't scale, but it is in the complexity class that allows essentially infinite parallelizability. So it is something that by expressing your it in that way, you actually can get massive amounts of scalability. It's probably the only successful parallel programming language until very recently. So yeah. this is why we, we use it. Yeah, I mean, you for documentation, for type yeah. of data, database, I mean, you can use uh, no SQL, you know, Cassandra, they, they got a uh, you know, 100 minute funding. So uh, I'm aware of that, right? At Stanford so, University, there's an NLP course and an NLU. Is this part of NLU or is it beyond NLU? Uh, so you can think about it as being building on NLU. We collaborate with Chris and Percy and those guys quite a bit. Uh, those distinctions, the NLP to NLU distinction was actually something brought on by funding agencies a while ago, to be very blunt about it. The request to try and deeply understand text is what everyone in linguistics and NLP is trying to do, understand that data more deeply. So you can view them as sort of all in a natural progression. 
NLP has become boxed up as a set of tools that work reliably, and NLU is really pushing the boundaries. So anything that doesn't work yet is NLU, and hopefully when it starts working, it becomes NLP. Let <laughs> me be too good of a summary. Did you mention you have an application for finance? Can you talk about that? Uh, maybe offline. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have one application for deep learning that I wanted to, to wrap up with, so I'll just tell you that last bit. So what we want to do is we want to look at images of different fossils, and we want to understand if we can teach our machine to do taxonomy. It turns out, oddly enough, that taxonomists are kind of experts, and they're dying out. They're not meaning new people who want to be taxonomy experts. And so people in museums, if you want to know, did I find a new bug, it's a very interesting process. You actually have to go show your bug to a bunch of people, experts, and they're like, yep, that's new, now you found yourself a new bug, okay? Glib summary, but roughly correct. So we want to understand, with that motivation, looking at images, can we teach the system to recognize from an image, like a museum slide, whether or not you know this is in whatever species or phylum or family or whatever. So in particular, this is a very early work. We took some documents, and we tried to extract you know, the peripherals, these are sponges and brachiopods. Okay? So how are we going to label this information? We could have someone sit there and click and label each image. This is a sponge, this is a brachiopod, so on. But we decided to use the fact that we had done extraction from this information in a technique called distance supervision, with basically no hand labeling whatsoever. So what we did is the following. We read the text, as I told you before. We had these little modules that are going and reading the text. And then we basically identified which figure is mentioned, and we labeled them, what taxa is actually specified in this image. And we segmented all the images automatically and spit them out into a big bunch of files. And now we have a bunch of images that are labeled, but they're probably incorrect, to be honest with you. Many of them are not actually correctly labeled by the program because it's a difficult inference task from the caption to the actual images that are there. Okay? So this is going to be very noisy. And then we do what everybody else does. We train a CNN. Now, this was kind of miraculous to me, so I wanted to share it with you. We're going to be posting all the code and all the rest very soon. But it turns out that just determining, determining between brachiopods and sponges, based on the stupidest training data that we could construct, literally a SQL query to build this, this training set, gives us about 94% accuracy. Now, I can't come close to that, but I don't know anything about this domain. And one of the things we're trying to understand is how close or far is that from human experts. There are indeed images here that the machine gets correct that human experts would have a very difficult time dealing with because it's some piece of an image, it's some fragment. And it seems that we can train these things up with relatively simple uh, overheads. So this is a way that you know, people often paint that there are these two things of AI that are going on. There's the old school you know, AI that is doing knowledge and reasoning and writing rules and doing this kind of statistical model. And then there's this new phase of machine learning. To me as an outsider, really as an outsider in background, they all are the same. They're all forming these loss equations and solving them. And there's no reason to not to fuse across. So this is one example where fusing across actually lets us build a pretty cool application in less than 24 hours. So I don't know. I think it's kind of awesome. Anyway, so with that, I want to wrap up. And I just wanted to tell you what I told you again in conclusion. The first thing is we talked about these knowledge bases that help with these macroscopic questions. We're motivated by this idea that we could read a huge amount of text and information and put it in a structured database that people could use and be able to query and do analysis on. That's what motivated us. We have this one idea that I wanted to share with you, that probabilistic inference yields algorithmic independence. That is, no one actually knows what we're running underneath the cover, but they can still trust it, which is the most important, and they can also debug it so they can construct these systems. And most of our users actually don't have CS degrees, or certainly not CS masters or PhD degrees. The last bit, and something that you know probably is where we spend the most amount of our time as a research group, is making inference hardware aware. Taking advantage of these modern systems that are out there that have new great features, wide SIMD lanes, or GPUs, or you know, Xeon Phi's, or maybe even ASICs, who knows? But trying to make them hardware aware so that we can remove all of the fat for these specialized problems. And there's lots of layers of fat in between the high-level specification and the low-level hardware. And the way we're getting these things to compute before the end of the universe is by trying to remove some of those layers. So with that, thank you so much, and I'm happy to take more questions. What can you say about you know, getting started steps for an area that's is mostly text, highly technical uh -huh. terms? You know, what, what would getting started be like, and what you what should uh, yeah. what I expect? Yeah, so we, we don't have a huge amount of expertise ramping people up, but we've ramped up tens of groups over the last couple of months and years. What we, what we tend to do is we have a set of tutorials that are on the page and we make them go through the boring, um, here's how you extract who's married to whom, here's how you extract capitals and states, here's how you do locations. We make them walk through those tutorials right away and that takes a little bit of time. One of the things that's a huge hassle is we use these big parallel database backends. A database called Greenplum is our backend. There's a lot of just logistic stuff that you have to get your head around in a relatively constrained context to be able to scale it up when you're done. 
once you've done that and you've sort of mastered the input output, which takes you know a couple days, then what you start to do is download your documents, go through and identify what are the key terms, try and write your first version of what we call uh, sort of distantly supervised extractor. So you would just try and write a couple of rules and feed that back into the system. The place where it clicks over and it starts to become less than completely tedious is when you produce your first set of extractions. It doesn't matter how bad they are, but as soon as you produce those first set of extractions, we have a bunch of tools that basically allow you to go through that process and start to look and reason by examples and say, what other information should I put into the system? And the one thing we stress to people is don't overbuild, don't overextract, and don't overintegrate. That is, start with the crappy version, just get it running end to end, and then know where to spend your time. The reason we don't do those pipeline approaches and what, where pipeline approaches get into themselves into trouble is they spend three years building a named entity recognizer, another three years linking the databases together, but they can't see if those are going to matter for their end application. And if you're a user who just wants the database at the end, you don't want to spend all that time. So what we suggest is you spend that time. Once you get into that phase, it's usually a little bit, right now, a little bit harder than it should be, but basically people go through that loop a couple of times, and then the quality monotonically increases, and then they get to a point where, they're, where they give up. We're trying to codify that process. End to end, it takes a couple of months, to be honest with you, of like a, a, you know, a student or a person, a professional who's doing this, defense contractor, that's kind of how long it takes. We would love to shrink from six months to six weeks to six hours, and that's what we're working on right now. Um, it is tough to set up, but you can, people have done it who are not in our group. That's a very low bar, but we've cleared, we've cleared that very low bar. Um, especially on the science side, uh, for how important is image or recognizing images when you have all that text around the image that's so uh, so, so actually so so some images are annotated. For example, we've been looking at uh, cancer pathology reports. So some of those images are annotated because they say oh, you have cancer, here's the image, here's the thing in the cells. Uh, but they're actually incompletely annotated and they're sometimes incorrectly annotated. And they have pathology reports on the side from experts versus volunteers. So being able to fuse across those has allowed us to get higher quality than mm -hmm. just looking at one source and label by itself. So in those cases when we're trying to exceed volunteer categories, uh, volunteer quality, it's actually quite important to have as many redundant pieces of information as we can. In fact, if you look at all of these examples, what we're really saying is that if you just try and reason with one line of text or image or style of text, you're missing some part of the picture. You could either critically identify all those pieces or you could throw them into this unholy suit. So this is just yet another thing that we're throwing into that picture. If you happen to have a domain where everything was perfectly annotated, then you don't have to go through the pain of doing any image analysis. But when we dug deeper into any one of them, they just don't have again time and cost. People haven't annotated them incompletely, or they've been annotated by volunteers and they're lower quality. We haven't really found a domain yet where the images were completely annotated. Um, we would actually prefer that because we didn't want to build all this image interface stuff. Um, but at least with our scientific collaborators we've seen so far, Stanford Hospital, Paleobiology. Um, people in the energy industry, that hasn't been the case. It's really been the case that you have to go into the industry. There's a need for it. Yeah, I mean, we we wouldn't have done it otherwise. We had no interest in waiting into this area. Great question. Turns out it's fascinating, so it was a win, but <laughs> yeah, accidental. Any other questions? Oh, please. Oh, I was wondering if you can consolidate the information that you did. I'm sorry, did you say that? So, so the scholars that they're helping you you know, I think that's a, that's a great thing. Like, this is not an end product, right? We never viewed this as a piece that was the end piece that we're, you know, now we're done. We've always been interested in, after you produce this knowledge base, how do you use it in your workflow and how does it help with the rest of your life? We're going a lot into diagnostic applications. But to focus on the application that you brought up, where you're saying, you know, you bring it in and then there's humans in the loop not curating this and reproducing some of the experiments. There's another great startup that's around that allows you to sort of effectively crowdsource lab experiments. You can slice it up into bits and steal time from people's machines. These kinds of efforts to come together around one of these knowledge base creation uh, engines would be phenomenal. It's just one more piece that you can throw into the mix. It's not even clear that it's the most important piece, but it is a piece that people could potentially rally around without having to deal with the deluge of literature and to do the rest of this community thing. We've done a little bit on helping with human annotations. We have some work that's going on in the lab. Uh, we haven't found anything there that's really super interesting yet, 
um, which is unfortunately our metric. It may be super useful, but that doesn't mean we do it. We're not in the useful game, actually. We're in the interesting game. Um, so we haven't found those nuggets. There's a great guy uh, named Mike, Michael Bernstein uh, at Stanford, who's sort of the king of crowdsourcing. He and Fei Fei Li, who's sort of the queen of vision, uh, working together uh, to put together this thing where they're trying to do crowdsourcing loops and annotating relations. And we had lots of conversations about it. So it's something people are thinking about, but not systematically yet able to apply to scientific applications. So it's a, it's a direction I think we're all hoping happens, but hasn't happened yet. I'd like to kind of beat a dead horse sure, sure. just a little bit further. It seems to me then, if, if, you, if I could go on and query your system by some query and I get basically X, right. okay, then I go on and should also be able to create and get not X. And if it turns out 75% of the data is bad, right. then it turns out we should be able to go on and get some percentages out there that also yep. give me the reverse. Yep. That being the case, then it'd be kind of cool with your stuff. You could go on and actually semantically verify how correct your stuff is simply by going on and determining how much bad data you've got in there. <laughs> Because you just basically took people that were trying to, you know, game the system. Well, yeah. So I think that's a great point. And one of the projects we're starting up now, postdocs just joining my lab. Uh, we've been talking over the phone for the past or Skype for the past couple of weeks. Is to try and understand how to automatically build quality models and how to build them declaratively, so yeah. people can put those features of, is this is this junk science? What how, what are the indications of it? How can we put those into a model that allows people to express them? Uh, and we have we have very few ideas right now. Uh, we don't have any good ones, but we're starting in that direction because clearly, you know, after you build it, the quality questions come up immediately. Right now, we do very heuristic and simple things that the experts are comfortable with. They don't trust facts that are old. This is a similar. One. You've heard one that says, if it's not repeated that often, it's probably false. Like, okay, <laughs> I can imagine a ton of problems with this statement, but all right, let's go with it. Uh, and so those are the kinds of, that's the, the state of the art right now in dealing with quality. And it's something that's a major research challenge. Um, people are thinking about it. There's a lot of smart people working on it. Nothing great to report quite yet. Thank you. Is that possible to uh, modify or change your engine to make it uh, uh, be possible or feasible to handle time series data? Is a pure new one? Uh, yeah, actually we have a, a project at Stanford called the Secure Internet of Things. And as you know, devices generate largely time signals. We are in the process of trying to understand how to fuse those time series with knowledge bases. Uh, we've tried this project once or twice. In fact, the reason we got into the Internet of Things is a separate toolkit that we released for regression in five databases mm -hmm. was used to monitor engines. It turned out there were lots of time series they were modeling, and we've been trying to fuse those. It hasn't happened quite yet, but at least from a principal standpoint, I don't see any reason why we couldn't, because you know we built both of the engines, we see kind of how they look, so it may be possible. It's not natively supported right now. There's a bunch of challenges to get it done, uh, and it's probably something that students will be working on. Good question. Stanford is doing this Prodigy project. Uh, Prodigy. Tell me about it. Uh, well, it's uh, it's doing uh, knowledge base for intelligent systems. Uh, has a link called Prodigy at Stanford RDD. It's an entity that maybe I maybe know it under a different name. So not so actually last year. Right. Yeah. So 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 maybe 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 Prodigy. Protege. Oh, Protege is something, yeah, Protege, no, that was, well, that's an ontology reasoning system that came out a couple oh. of years ago. Yeah. So I, I should say, though, uh, there was a workshop last year at Stanford called Swank. I, my name is stupid. Anyway, but it was the Stanford workshop on knowledge and AI and something else, whatever, just to make it taste nice. Anyway, but uh, what we did is invite a bunch of people who were working in this area, and there's a ton of people who are working in this space. Some of them are working on the robotic side, some are working on the vision side, some of them are working on you know application side. Some are working on the engine side, and we got kind of all those people together, you know, the Watson folks, the Knowledge Graph folks, and all of, all of them together. So there's a lot of activity. I wouldn't claim to represent even a fraction of it. This is just the stuff that we've been hammering on for the last couple of years. Maybe the last question, and then afterwards, you know, talk to the speaker. Yeah, patents is the most common thing we get asked for. It's funny. Uh, yeah, so patents are publicly available. We have the NLP markup. Uh, we have, it turns out they're a great source for uh, drug and gene interaction, so drug repurposing, so people crawl patents for that. Uh, there's actually a, a large multinational corporation that uses deep dives to do some patent extraction right now. Um, you can probably figure them out from the logos on our page. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, people, that's one of the most common things that people request. We haven't surfaced the downstream content of that because it seems that people are going after these narrow verticals, semiconductor materials, or uh, drug and gene interactions, or something like that. What we did instead is just mark up as much of the patent data as we can, and we put the, from the USPTO, we don't, we have some Japanese patents too. We put those and mark them up and put them on the web page. 
Um, but it is something that we get probably, I would say, one out of every 10 requests comes for patents. So yeah. Ah, great question. So this is why we're interested in patents. So the images that are in there, if you've ever looked at a patent, have lots of diagrams. And di reading diagrams is extremely interesting to us. We can read tables. We have some papers about them. We can't do it as reliably as we would like. But we really want to re read diagrams, especially from the biomedical literature, to understand higher level kinds of declarative statements rather than the facts that we're collecting right now. The short answer is not yet. We can't really do it. Uh, we have some papers about trying to do it, um, but we're not really there yet. But that's why we're that's that's what motivated us. Great question. That's, that's what we're asking. Good. Thanks. <laughs>